Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, why whales, wherever in the world you are today. It's a common problem that we can communicate anywhere in the world that we want, you know, seamlessly with with no friction, uh, except for the time zones. And so sometimes people are up a little late, sometimes they're they're up a little early. Um, but more so than that, it, it's a really amazing kind of way that we're able to communicate and kind of bring true entrepreneurs that their voices may not be heard um, in, in the larger mainstream medias. Uh, you know, we're a small asset class. We're really working on things. So I just love the fact that we're able to get such amazing institutional professionals um, that, that are really working hard and understand this asset class to a level of which I will say almost zero journalists can even comprehend. Um, our guest today is, is Klaus with DigiShares, and I am, I am thrilled and excited uh, to have an actual uh, recovering real estate lawyer with me today, uh, with Mr. Mafia Mike, uh, to kind of help me with, with kind of the concepts around this. Because to me, there, there is you know, some, some really kind of amazing opportunities that blockchain unlocks. And I think everyone focuses on just currencies. You know, how do you manage a currency and everything else? Um, the, the concept around digitizations of assets, uh, real estate in particular, is uh, I'm, I'm going to throw some numbers around and, and I'm, I'm going to guarantee you that I'm, I'm probably on the low end, but in excess of $300 trillion markets. Um, this, is, this is a, you know, centuries old um, kind of literally uh, real estate and, and prostitution, I think, were the two first uh, initial uh, initial <laughs> um, professions that were out there. And so really understanding that that this is an asset class that is ready for disruption, but it has to be done in a proper way because a three an asset class will never get to that size of 300 plus trillion dollars without some amazing guardrails put in place. So let me go ahead and, and take a step back. And, and Mike, uh, any, anything to add to kind of that intro before we uh, unleash Clash? Uh, I want to add that the the focus so often on this industry is on American real estate and American property because it perhaps is the largest real estate market in the world. Um, the vast size of the country, coupled with sort of a robust um, you know setup of legislation uh, and common law and 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 law that we inherited from from our friends the British a long time ago. To the extent that we have a U.S. centric conversation. Or tone in our questions. It's not. It's not uh, intentional. Uh, it just sort of comes at us naturally, and, and maybe we'll, we'll uh, be behind in the future on this topic. I suspect we might. I'm excited, Klaus, to hear what you have to say. But I also want to apologize in advance um, for to, to to anybody uh, that feels that we came at this uh, from an imperialist U.S. perspective. Uh, no need. And uh, I only bring that up because this is perhaps the first area in which I see. Uh, the hedge money that we've experienced in my lifetime uh, threat. Um, and so that's yep. all I'd add, Jay. Fabulous. So before we dive into, uh, you know, Klaus, your current project, uh, DigiShares, let's kind of understand, you know, how you got here. And, and really, you have an amazing background that I'd love to just start off exploring. So thank you, sir, for hanging out with us today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it, it's, no, it's, it's no need to... Uh, uh, apologize about being u.s centric uh, we are a u.s centric firm even though i'm based in denmark we actually just redomiciled the, the company to the u.s one week ago wow. and the the main major focus of the company is on the u.s market it is the biggest market for what we're doing here it's the easiest place to to work for us i would say globally from a legal perspective but um yeah, so my name is Klaus. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of uh, the company. We started four years ago, but uh, of course, my own uh, professional background goes uh, further back. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a researcher by background. I have a PhD in computer science uh, focused on AI technology, actually. So I worked on AI for the first uh, many years, uh, trying to commercialize various ideas within the AI space. My first company was actually a spin out of Hewlett Packard where I worked a lot with uh, the HP R&D in uh, the Silicon Valley, uh, Bay Area, um, with uh, with uh, people from uh, HP Labs, basically, for a long time. Um, we took that technology out and uh, into a spin-out of HP called uh, Decide, with the, with the goal of actually sort of uh, commercializing AI technology for troubleshooting and diagno diagnostics of uh, HP uh, computer equipment and uh, software and printers and so on. And uh, I worked as a CEO for that uh, company for many years and uh, made an exit at the end, uh, stopped in the company and started uh, doing other things. I also sort of uh, lost my interest for AI during the process. Uh, 
I have the a little bit unpopular opinion that AI is more of sort of a marginal value add rather than a really disrupting technology. Of course, I've seen the, the chatbot the last few days, so maybe I'll revise my opinion. But I don't think we've seen that much disruption from AI technology over the years. We've seen we've seen uh, earlier generations of chatbots, and we've seen uh, ch- character recognition, and we've seen self-driving cars and stuff like that. Uh, so. So some disruption, but but not not as much. Um, I think I think blockchain is actually much more interesting and uh, gives the ability to really disrupt um, finance and real estate and uh, other industries uh, in a way that it it couldn't be done without blockchain technology. So for me, it's, it's actually much more interesting than than AI. Um, before I before I started on uh, DD shares, I was. Uh, an innovation consultant for a few years for a local university here, and I also started all, several other companies uh, be, before before this one. Um, so I've been a serial entrepreneur for many years, and uh, also been advising and mentoring many uh, other companies, uh, sitting on boards and uh, doing small investments and stuff like that. Um, but no. uh, but we got into the black blockchain space around uh, six years ago. I started a different project that actually didn't work out. But we sort of started to understand the, the, the space, the industry, and uh, what we thought could be uh, potential, uh, potentially interesting to develop as, as a company, right? So we, we, we sort of got wind of tokenization about five years ago, and uh, we needed it for our own project. And we could see that the providers, the, the vendors at the time, didn't have anything really Impressive, I would say it was pretty pretty basic back then. So we decided to, to create a do a pivot and basically develop our own technology for tokenization as as a kind yeah. of infrastructure white label play, yeah. which is still so, what we so, do today. So so let's dive into that in a second. But I want to take a second and talk about a few things that you talked about in your your, your past. And to me, um, the most important thing that could be happening right now in Web three is having professionals like yourself that bring you know a, a depth of knowledge into a, from a variety of other asset classes into Web three. Too often, uh, emerging technology based asset classes are focused on pure technology and not really on the adoption uh, in, in real world usage, which is probably exactly what you're saying uh, about AI. It's you can do a bunch of cool demos. You can make a bunch yeah. of crowds clap and cheer, um, but in your day to day life, does it actually work? I I, I have the ab- you know absolute latest and greatest uh, Model X from Tesla, uh, you know that, that has every single option you can, and I am in the beta uh, for the for the AI self driving platform. Um, literally just got the the latest update maybe a week ago, of which Elon said this is revolutionary and, and whatnot. It is terrifying to be in that car. It is absolutely a horrifying experience <laughs> to sit there and, and to think that this $130,000 vehicle is not about to kill me and everyone on the road. Um, it is so, so it's, 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 it's evolving and I'll give it, it's way better than anything else I've seen. It is not a comfortable experience yet. And it has to be better than what I can do in and of myself. Yeah. So what's your, what did you play with chat GP? I just got to ask. I did. I did. I asked it to define tokenization and uh, other interesting questions. It did a good job, I have to say. I asked it to I asked it to write uh, SEC regulations for the <laughs> digitization of assets, and it gave me like a three page, like really well written, like thesis wow. behind it with wow. sources. So I, I got to say, um, it may not be able to do a hundred percent, but if we can get eighty percent of the work kind yeah. of framed out, it, that yeah. it's a game changer for. Uh, a lot I of haven't people. used it yet, yeah. but a friend of mine uh, published on Facebook a rap song. He had it right about golf, so that was pretty fun. <laughs> Yes, nice. It is. Uh, it's very interesting. So, so Klaus, let's go ahead and pivot right back over to DigiShares. Um, and again, the background to me is very important to ask because it really helps frame the understanding that, that you're not a, a first time entrepreneur. Um, you clearly know how to build a company. And to me, that's that that's that's a core foundation first that you have to be able to understand, you know, legal compliance and, and regulations right off the bat for your own company before you can start representing others uh, yeah. and, and their legal adoption and, and whatnot. So, what, uh, if you can kind of run us through, you know, what DigiShares is today um, and kind of what your, your roadmap looks like for the next uh, next few quarters. even. Yeah. So basically we sell, we basically, as a software company, we sell software for tokenization on a wide label basis. So companies come to us, real estate developers come to us 
um, to buy our, a license for our software and we uh, customize it and we install it and we help them get started using it. Uh, so they can use the software to tokenize their own assets and they do it in order to, I would say, fundraise for new development projects or sell off existing assets or manage using it as a kind of investor, investor management uh, system, uh, making distributions, uh, dividends, uh, managing the share cap table and so on, and also to facilitate trading, right? So to make it easy for the investors to, to trade. So that's basically what we do now and uh, what we will also continue to do in the future. So we sell it on a software as a service basis and we working on scaling that up and making it easier to use the system, making it more user friendly and uh, making it possible for us to, to deploy the solution in a few hours instead of a, a few months um, and just uh, improving on that process all the time. right? Um, so that's that's the bread and butter of what we do. And then uh, sort of new development, uh, we are working on an exchange. A global exchange also for real estate, which will be uh, accessible, I would say, for all our clients, but also for anyone else with tokenized assets out there that would like to get them traded on, I would say, a DeFi native kind of exchange. Um, and then also, we are, we are working on different licenses. So we are getting a crowdfunding license in the US, so we can use our platform also for crowdfunding purposes. So, so basically, a raise up to 5 million for retail investors. We think the retail angle is really important for tokenization. It's one of the basic visions of what we want to do. Um, we're getting a transfer aid and license also, so we can use our system for sort of a more institutional level share cap table management system. And uh, yeah, so we've got enough on our plate. <laughs> That's a lot. That's huge. So uh, two questions, and then I know that that uh, Mafia Mike over here is going to take things away. Um, so when you're you're talking about digitizing, what what exactly are you digitizing? Are you digitizing the generally held uh, real estate held in an LLC? Are you digitizing the title, uh, REITs? You know, define kind of what's being uh, put on chain. We are almost always uh, tokenizing, digitizing, and tokenizing the shares of an LLC, the okay. ownership interest of an LLC. In the US, same thing in Europe, same thing in Asia. So we always sort of work on a securitized company, right? That owns the underlying asset. And then we, we create tokenized shares, shares that are represented with tokens on the blockchain and sort of represent the ownership interest in the underlying asset. We use, we use the company or the SPV form as an intermediary because it's generally not possible. We haven't seen any sort of a way to, to do it today to tokenize the underlying title. Because you'd need to integrate with the land title registry and, and they don't really support that anywhere in the world right now today. And also you'd need to develop some kind of inter in investment contract around the title that would regulate value appreciation, uh, distributions and so on. And that would also be difficult actually for the investors to understand. So we reuse the, an existing concept called shares, right, which has been used for many years and is easily understandable and there's a nice regulation around it. And in most countries, including the US, we can digitize shares, we can digitize the share cap table, we can digitize various corporate actions and so on. Everything works well, even in tokenized form. Yeah. And, and so that you actually touched on my second question is your congratulations on creating a lot of securities. Um, you yeah. know, how, how is that, you know, managed from a compliance level? Um, because, you know, the, the tokenization of shares still needs to be kept, you know, in conjunction with operating agreements and other legal entities. Yeah. So, uh, so we use, it, it's a question with many layers, I guess you could say. So okay. we, we, we are sort of half a legal tech firm, right? We have a, our own legal counsel that helps to get this right, make sure we are compliant and all the clients are compliant globally. We also always work with a local legal partner in the country where we carry out the project to make double sure that we are compliant. Um, then we use, I would say, audited, regulated, licensed, protocols like ESE 1404, mm. ESE 1400, and so on, that are sort of prepared for working with securities on the chain, demanding that wallets are whitelisted and putting certain transfer restrictions in place. So everything can be controlled, I would say, to a quite uh, detailed uh, level. It also means that a tokenized share cannot just be listed on Uniswap or anything like that because it, it would wouldn't wouldn't work right you'd need to be in a sort of semi-permission environment to to be compliant 
Um, and uh, and that's those are some of some of the elements, right, that we use to try to stay compliant or to, to stay compliant. We also sort of uh, make a link between the token itself and the legal okay. entity that we tokenize to make sure that there is, uh, you, you've seen examples of NFTs getting disconnected from the underlying asset, right? We don't want that to happen, of course. So, so the, of course, the, the legal entity that we tokenize has in its sort of operating agreement or bylaws that it, it, it there is, that there is a possibility to represent the ownership shares with tokens. And the token itself has a link back to something similar to a share certificate, right? So you can actually, from the token, find out who owns who, which asset it's linked to. Yeah. Um, and that's that's sufficient in most jurisdictions, actually, to have sort of the legal and the technical link between the asset and the and the token itself. Yeah. But it's some it's an area I would say that is developing, and uh, the legal sort of understanding of this is developing, and uh, it's not the same in all countries, and it's 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 rather complicated. <laughs> it, it's extremely complicated. The last point I'll make, and then Mike, it's over to you, um, is is I will state for myself, um, and, and kind of the theses of Y Whales, we entirely support legal compliance, um, yeah. you know, we'll, in, in, in adhering to any and all uh, regulatory uh, kind of standards. So, so really, again, from that perspective, I know it's very easy to just do things and throw them out yeah. there. And that's where a lot of people are just like, eh, you know, give, give a developer a case of Red Bull and a case of beer. And, you know, 48 yeah. hours later, you've got a bunch of garbage, you know, floating about uh, Web3 that's, that's un- impossible to unwind. So I just want to applaud you for, for taking the time and doing it right. It costs a lot more. It takes a lot longer to do. Um, but, but really love hearing your approach. So thank you so much. We stay out of jail. Yeah, that way, much easier. Well, so so does Sam Bankman right now, <laughs> yeah. but we don't know how that's working. No, so it's no. it, yeah, we won't go there. Yeah, but, uh, I I think it sounds like Klaus had to give a bunch of lawyers a case of Red Bull and a couple of cases yeah. of, of beer or scotch to get going. Um, it sounds like a Herculean effort to be able to dance through the 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 specter of the regulations that may or may not even exist from the SEC or some other you know. Uh, you know, abbreviated agency in the United States. But what I think is fascinating is that you have capitulated, it sounds like, to that lowest common denominator of, listen, we'll, we'll, we'll play by their rules so long as we know that they exist. Um, yeah. and, and it was fascinating. I, I'm just taking a lot of notes. You wrote that the, basically each token is linked back to, you know, a share registration. What, what, that, what that led me down to ask, so as I'm writing down some questions here, is really the notion of identity and and, and uh, privacy and, and then contrasting that, and this is really more of a topic I want to talk about than a question. Um, you know, the, the idea that, and you said the word DeFi, so then Jay and I instantly, you know, sort of straightened up our spines a little bit. Um, this is not permissionless. It's not trustless. No. And so you have what I think is a, a very elegant framework to get us from the old school world of real estate syndication, if you will, is really the, probably the way that word I would use to web three, but you're not stopping just yet at the door of web three. You're still in, in a hybrid world where you've again, I guess it capitulated because I think I don't, I'm guessing that's not your desire, right? But that's what you had to do to not go to jail or, or risk going to jail. And so, you know, can you walk us through that arc of the trade-offs or the benefits? Cause it, it's not all bad, yeah. right? I mean, Jay and I talk about this all the time. Like, regulate us. Just tell us what the rules are. We'll play. We're good. We yeah. just don't want to be on the old rails. We don't want to be in the old world where it takes too many intermediaries or too many inefficiencies. So regulate yeah. us. But then you've gone ahead and you're put your money where your mouth is and said, I'm building um, a white labeled service, which I think is clever because then you can get other people to to take take you know and, and scale. But talk to me about that arc from the world of the old school, you know. Uh, Luddite-based real estate technology, and and where you are on your journey. Yeah, it's an interesting question that you can speak a lot, speak about for a long time. I think so. We are we are fortunate in a way, I would say, because we we uh, work within existing securities regulation, right? So we, it's not like the general crypto space where, in many cases, no regulation exists, and you have to guess right what you need to do. Here, we actually it, it's. It's, it's easier for us in a way because we, we just have to follow existing securities regulation. And the best situation for us, if, 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 is, if, if just the regulator sort of accepts 
that a digital tokenized share is exactly the same as a share, right? It's the same. It's just in digital form. Most do regulators think, see is that this. A question that you think is still an open question, or do you feel good about that? I, I, in, I've, in most countries, I feel good about it, and it's sort of confirmed by the regulator that a tokenized share, it's not crypto, right? right? It's a share. It's right. a just a digital share. It's not crypto. We have, a, as we have the situation in a few countries where they see it as crypto, right? So if you tokenize a share, it becomes crypto. But in most countries, it's, it's, it is just a share. So we just have to follow normal securities regulation and everything is fine. So in that way, we are better off, I would say, than the general crypto space, especially also because the crypto space will have to undergo the same regulation over the next few years, right? So we're just starting on it before before they they are, right? So we they will, they will have to catch up later. Um, so Uniswap will not continue, I think, to be completely permissionless. Maybe it will, or maybe it will not. In, in, in the European Union, for instance, uh, it will be sort of difficult to make transfers from a, a self-custodied wallet in the future, right? And I think most jurisdictions will probably adopt this. Mm-hmm. So most wallets will be KYC in the future, similar to bank accounts. So so Uniswap will also to some, some degree be KYC uh, and permission, right? So I think what will happen is that the two spaces will merge. So we will see a lot of the stuff that we are doing now will also be enforced on the remaining part of the crypto space. So they will converge. And we will see, I think to some degree, right? So like a subsystem developing of on the in, within the DeFi space that is for securities mm-hmm. and not for crypto, right? But it'll become larger eventually than the crypto space, much larger because real estate assets is 300, 300 trillion, right? It's like, 10,000 more than we have in the crypto space today, right? It's much, much larger. So I think once we get all that tokenized and into the, the DeFi space, the permissioned DeFi space will become huge, containing all stocks, all, all, all assets, real, all real estate assets, private equity, and so on. It's massive. Yeah. Do, what, what, what chain are you on right now? So we actually chain agnostic, right? But but most most uh, of our projects are done on Ethereum. Yeah. Still, um, I think we see a few being done on Polygon uh, and other chains. And we are also implementing a new chain called Polymesh, mm-hmm. which is especially for security tokens. Um, but uh, but frankly, Ethereum is is the the safe. Bit, uh, I would say, because it has the largest ecosystem, it has a lot of custodians, a lot of exchanges, a lot of stable coins. Everything is there, right? Ready to use. I, yeah. I don't want to turn this into a, 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 little, a legal discussion, but as you apply for licenses that you mentioned, um, have you noticed some jurisdictions are more accommodative to you or the other way around? Have you noticed any that are creating friction for you? Like, does the US want to give you a Money transmitter license? Or are we saying, you know, no? I mean, what, what, what's, what's been what, just a short summary of the, the ability to navigate the existing fr- framework? Yeah, I don't know that much about it actually. So generally, we try to operate without any kind of licenses, and uh, and we since we are just a software provider, we really don't need a license. In in some cases, our clients may need a license, but if in the in, in the normal case where they just tokenize their own assets facilitate trading in their own assets they don't need a license yeah. either uh, so it's only sort of when we want to expand the scope of our business model and be able to offer it for crowdfunding for instance in the us act as a transfer aid and stuff like that then we need to have a license for it and uh, we haven't we haven't uh, met any problems in sort of the, the quite limited licensing uh, requests we've 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 done Are, so let's, let's, put, let's flip the question a little differently then are any jurisdictions um, getting it right or doing it doing it better than everybody else is there any country that really stands out to you yeah yeah i think uh, i I think i think there is right you see some countries that have over regulated i think like what i said before where they actually view a a tokenized security as a as a kind of crypto which clearly it it shouldn't be right The, the optimal situation is for a country to just update its existing securities regulation to say that a share can be in digital form and the share cap table can be in digital form. That's actually pretty much all we need, right? But a few countries like, I think like Liechtenstein and uh, Malta, maybe Gibraltar and so on, 
have sort of over-regulated and created a lot of sort of new concepts in the regulation, a lot of sort of new sort of actors in the ecosystem that uh, needs to be licensed and recognized and so on and needs to be not notified or even uh, sort of uh, asked or applied to if you want to, to tokenize an asset, right? And that's that's a problem, I think, and that's that's a, uh, not a good way to handle it. I think the US, have, US has done it a good job and most countries uh, also did a good job on the regulatory side right before our sub industry which is sort of concerned with just digital securities right mm -hmm. yeah and it's going to be a rapidly evolving asset class um you know yeah. of which there's going to be a lot of again right now in the us uh, you know i can only speak that you know the cftc is fighting with the sec and, and a variety of other three-letter agencies to who who is going to control digital assets um yeah. and we do want to have one we, we want one person one agency to kind of have control and I, I hope that they just form a new one uh but i doubt that's going to happen so, so we're going to end up underneath somebody's purview and, and and we can cross our fingers that it goes well for us yeah Walk, walk us through, pretend that, uh, maybe it's not pretend, let's assume Jay and I don't know very much about, about the, 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 the ideals here. What's the benefit to a BlackRock or a Blackstone or, you know, Goldman Sachs <laughs> to adopt a, a digitization? What are the, the, the sort of low hanging fruit that you solve from a cost perspective to where it's worth paying somebody else? to put us into a new kind of risk because no one really knows how the litigation is going to work with digital tokens. So I know one's seen a bankruptcy necessarily of digitized LLCs, um, right? So walk me through what you provide me if I'm a giant you know, equity fund or a giant uh, hedge fund that's looking to take advantage of, of this newfangled technology. So, so first off, I would say, I think litigation will remain the same uh, the, the the benefit of the security token protocols that we use is that you can actually burn and reissue tokens. So you, if if you have someone that sort of has a number of uh, tokenized shares in a certain property or project, and they are in breach of agreement, then they need to give back their shares. You can actually forcefully forcefully remove those tokens back to the, the company wallet. Unlike what you unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum and so on, you have certain controls put in where you can override the normal functionality of the blockchain because it's required by law. So it's easier for us to follow litig litigation and uh, sort of uh, make things right. Um, and then on, on, on the big uh, uh, private equity funds and so on. So we actually speak to them on a regular basis and uh, they are very interested in the space. Um, I think their, their benefits are quite, the value that they get out of it are, is sort of different from the typical client we sign up, which is, would be a medium, medium, small to medium sized real estate development firm. Um, but, but I think the big, the big uh, private equity firms, for them, it's more a matter of, I would say, they like the fractionalization idea. Right now they target like ultra high net worth, uh, paying in like a million and upwards. They also want to fractionalize and go into retail, get access to retail sort of to democratize access to their private uh, equity funds. Where, but I think they also see it as a way for them to save or reduce at internal administrative costs, much easier settlement uh, among uh, settlement and trading and so on internally among their clients and so on, I think is, is a huge advantage also for them. Um, so, so real quick yeah. on, on that note, and I'm going to steal, steal them back for yeah. a second, Mike. Um, we've talked about real estate and, and kind of the background there, but the, the core concepts is, and, and basically now that I understand exactly what you're doing, uh, you're managing on-chain securities and on an on-chain security can be anything. It can be yeah. a REIT, uh, it can be a company, it can be an asset. Um, you know, if somebody wants to, to tokenize the, the, uh, uh, theor theoretically, a, uh, their own business and, and, yeah. and do fundraising through that. It can be done, but but you're making sure that they're adhering to the laws of the SEC related to securities. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very important point. And it, it, it you know, again, real estate's a three hundred trillion dollar market. I like that you, you started small um, yeah. and really going after the big things from there. So that's that's fabulous to hear. How what what other assets have you tokenized besides real estate today? Quite a lot, actually. Uh, so, of course, we are focused on real estate, but the, the platform is totally agnostic and can, can be used for any kind of asset. So it's, uh, I would say, energy and renewables type projects like wind farms and solar farms and so mm. on. 
um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of startup crowdfunding type applications. Um, we have a whiskey distillery uh, using the system as a whiskey as an investment object. That's yeah, that's one I enjoy a lot myself. Um, and uh, collectibles, uh, private equity funds, investment funds, of course. Uh, as I think private equity is is uh, the second largest asset class. Or even the biggest, biggest maybe it's close. It's about the same size as real estate, so it's also a huge, it might, it might huge count, one, right? There are so many real estate private equity funds. Maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, interesting uh, ideas. I think. So we've so, had a, we've had a lot of uh, yeah, interesting cases come to us, like with uh, very uh, unique projects that people want to fund using tokenization. Have you seen any any vendors approach you that want to participate in the ecosystem you're creating? For instance, I might want to lend people cash and they can post their whiskey distillery interests as collateral and they're willing to, to lend inside your environment. Is, are you seeing people that want to plug in as, as DeFi uh, concepts, have, you know, plugged into the, 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 the layer ones that we, we know about? Not so much, not so much, and it's not done a lot yet. And I think it, it it's because we don't have enough liquidity. I think for the DeFi lending to work, we need to have the assets liquid first, uh, because otherwise they cannot sort of uh, get rid of the collateral if the lending contract is is uh, is uh, cancelled. Uh, and we are not simply not there yet. So I haven't seen it to any significant degree. So so for us, uh, it's really about getting the exchange working first, and then. Uh, following that, we would partner with someone like Aave. They have the uh, Aave Arc institutional sort of permissioned uh, lending ecosystem, right, which we could fit really well yeah. into. And then uh, the, I, I'm sure there would be uh, a lot of lenders that would be uh, very interested in using collateralized real estate as 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 uh, yeah as a lending object rather than crypto because it's much less volatile. So I, I own a real estate investment, and I have some some partners who have digital shares um, through through DigiShares and, uh, we're, you know, we're, let's say we're small and we're in that walled garden that you, that you described. Um, and I want to distribute the, the proceeds, right? We, we have rent, we have income. I want to distribute it. Is, is anyone yet plugged in just to make the distributions also exist on, on chain? Or is it, are you still seeing a, a side world where people are writing physical checks only? Yeah. Yeah, that's also a good question. So the real estate space is maybe not the most crypto savvy <laughs> space, I would say. So a lot of our clients uh, actually still uh, prefer fiat-based payments and also fiat-based distributions from the system, right? So we support that. We have to. I hope, I know it's just for a short-term sort of transition, transitionary yeah. period, but but uh, that's the way things are right now. And do you have any example of someone distributing in, the, in that sort of round tripping it into your into your orbit? Not that, yet. Uh, that, we didn't get to that point yet, but I think it will come within uh, like a few a few yeah, months. I'm excited. Yeah, to watch te that. Te technologically, I, I'm sure you guys are more than than competent to get it yeah. done. It's it's yeah. the fact that you know there's a very big difference between someone throwing out five thousand dollars for an NFT that may or may yeah. not do something versus someone throwing out fifty million dollars uh, to, to acquire a building. Yeah. And you know uh, there there are just still too many risks in in cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain yeah. technology overall. Oh yeah. Um, Klaus, give me, you've given us a ton of successes that you guys have had, and I'm, I'm really impressed and excited by what you're doing. Um, give us some of the challenges or, or warnings that you've had along the way that, that kind of framed why you stay away from potentially certain certain assets or, you know, that you derived, uh, you know, kind of the rules and regulations you are amongst yourselves. Yeah, I think I think uh, I, I could uh, point out a few uh, f a few areas. Uh, so the space, the, the tokenization space, actually initially sort of originated from the ICOs, right? So it took over after the ICOs, and then we had STOs, security token offerings, which was, I think, in my mind, an equally almost equally bad idea. Tokenization itself should just be about raising investment, raising funding for some start a project right it should be much more about i would say automating financial infrastructure creating making it easy to trade and so on and automating a lot of different processes because we because we represent security with a token 
So unfortunately, we've gone away from the STO concept on to, to speaking more about tokenization, right, as a kind of infrastructure for financial uh, institutions and real estate uh, developers and so on. I think that was the first sort of uh, challenge we, we, we faced. Um, then I would say the overall ecosystem development sometimes goes too slow. Um, like I mentioned before, right, we have many clients still preferring fiat-based uh, investments and distributions. And uh, I can understand them actually because it is it's it is actually, it's pretty hard, right, still to get into the crypto ecosystem, install your MetaMask and uh, convert some dollars into USDC and so on. It's not easy. So that's a problem that all of us face within the industry, but it, it is getting easier every month, right? So, so we'll get there eventually. It's like the internet when it started. It wasn't easy to use either. So it takes some time. Yeah, um, I, I, I still I still feel, you know, as I as I sit around here with my ledgers and USB keys, yeah. that I refer to this as my 14K modem. Yeah. Um, yep, there you go. And, and yeah. uh, you know, every time I, I do it, I'm like, I, this is, I'm dialing into some random server. Like, it's just, yeah. it's the old days of, yeah. we're, we're, we're pre-IP address, we're pre-domain names, we actually have the phone numbers of the, of the yeah. modems you're dialing into. That's how early it. we are. Yeah, it's a good way to say it. Um, I, I spend yeah. a lot of time trying to explain this to people and it's, that's, yeah. that's what seems to work out the best for me. Yeah. So, so um, jumping back over to everything that you guys are doing today and, you know, I, I love that again, I, we're so early in an asset class, go after the trillion dollar market caps. I, I look at people chasing after million dollar opportunities and I go, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for that. There's yeah. big things that have to happen. Um, wh what is your thoughts around, you know, again, this is building these walled gardens, which is the way, which is what you're building and you have to compliantly do so. Do you ever believe that we'll get to the point of having infrastructure that allows for, for the free trading of, of securities in, in any country? Um, that might allow this. U.S. I don't see it happening, but I think there may be other countries that allow a little bit more of a free market economy. Yeah, I think I think we'll we'll just inherit the existing uh, rules for it. Right, it will not be be much changed. I think a, a tokenized share will will behave itself exactly like a, a normal share, a normal analog share. So if you can't trade a normal share from the U.S. to China. You'll not be able to trade a tokenized share either, but actually, yeah. I think it's not it's not that bad, right? Because I think the the global regulation allows you to do stuff like a Reg D, Reg S in the U.S., and you can market to international investors quite easily, and uh, vice versa, right? So I yeah. think it's actually not that bad, and I think it's moving in the right direction. I think there is an understanding among the regulators that, for instance, you need to include the retail investors in everything we're doing here you can't exclude them from this right exactly. they should have access uh, they should have equal opportunity to get access to re to real estate for instance as an investment object um and, so and i think I, that I is holy yeah i wholly agree with that i mean think about the the insane gambles that people have made with yeah. with their money into the cryptocurrency market on yeah. On, on things that are, are useless, you have yeah. no value, will never have any value. People know they have no value going into it, but they just, yeah. well, you know, it worked for so-and-so, it worked for so-and-so and try. The concept of getting a steady yield, a real yield from yeah. an actual, you know, asset that, that has a, a resale value and will always have a resale value, yeah. uh, providing that the team, the operating team that runs it is valid. I mean, this is this is a game changer to be able to anywhere yeah. in the world, to be able to get, you know, the, the quality of, of Switzerland real estate, to get the quality <laughs> of, of New York, uh, you know, New York real estate from, from, you know, my house in Missouri is, is a, is a huge game changer of which, and yeah. then I can have liquidity when I, when I need and when I want. Yeah. So exactly. I love that. The, the, uh, other assets, uh, the other asset classes that, that are not quite as large as real estate, although some of them get there. Um, what do you think the most, the most explosive will be? What class of asset do you think will be most likely to uh, adopt your service or be your biggest customer pool or total addressable market? What's, what do you think you're pointing in directions? Judging from the interest right now, I would say private equity, actually. Uh, I think I think the, the, the private equity uh, segment of the market is really interested in in this uh, in this technology here, and they want to use it internally. They want to use it to fractionalize and to distrib distribute their uh, their assets right to all types of investors. They want to fractionalize. 
so I think generally private equity as as an asset class will will be probably the next next big thing. Can you can you walk me through real quick? Um, you, you talked earlier about a partner with um, Poly uh, Mesh, um, yep. which is I believe part of Poly Math. Um, but but Poly Poly Mesh is a very interesting. Uh, we, we've we've had Vince on before and, and had a number of conversations with them. Can you walk us through kind of what that partnership looks like and why? Because um, I, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, as as I think actually Polymass and Polymesh are now two separate independent organizations because I think the foundation was created right to run the Polymesh chain right. um, to bring everyone on an equal footing. Um, so we uh, we've been a long time partner with Polymass. I would say the company behind it. We use the ESC fourteen hundred protocol and uh, we like it because it's open, it's standardized, anyone can use it. Yep. It's heavily ordered and and, and and so forth, tested in many cases. So now the, the team behind it decided to create their own chain focused on securities uh, called Polymesh. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's based on Polkadot technology and uh, they've, they've developed the chain now. And uh, we, we actually the first, we are the first company to support it sort of from an issuance perspective, right? So we can mint tokens on it. We can basically tokenize an asset on the Polymesh chain and we can manage the share cap table on it, create wallets and so on and do a lot of stuff. Um, because we, uh, we we think it's it's a, it's, a, it's a good chain basically. So it's, it, I would say it's the best technology that, technology that we have right now in the security tokenization space. Um, it, it, it's, it's really well designed and well developed and carefully tested and so on. And it's sort of has functionality that allows I would say a more secure institutional environment for tokenization. Um, so if all the all the node operators on the chain are sort of regulated entities. Um, if you work, if you sort of transact on the chain, you need to be KYC. Um, not you're not revealing any sort of personally personal identifiable and information on the chain, of course, but you need to be KYC and recognized by a trusted partner. And then there's a special functionality for settlement and so on. And uh, they prevent that you can just make airdrops of possibly securities right into people's wallets. So, so there's a non- number of functionalities they've added sort of to make it a sec- more secure environment for, for securities uh, transactions and uh, tokenization. So we, we like that. And uh, it's early days for the chain, right? So they are putting together the ecosystem around it. They, they want, of course, they need to support a stable coin for payments, custodians, exchanges, and so on. But they're putting it together slowly. Yeah, no, I, I love that, and, and and I just love hearing that the Polkadot team is is just winning so many amazing projects to it because yeah. I, I I find it fascinating. Um, we haven't deployed anything on on uh, Polkadot yet, but I, I think it's my next our next chain to uh, yeah. to start testing the whales on. You mentioned right. um, you know uh, something that really caught my eye, my eye here, which is that you know the security is paramount, um, but I also think about like the 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 liability that I, if I'm a PE fund or I'm a, a sponsor of a PE fund, I may love this technology, but I don't want anybody to be able to see my cap table, right? I don't want anybody to know no. who's who. I don't want somebody at another company that happens to use DigiShares as a service to be able to see what's going on in my instance of it. Um, I mean, I assume you'll claim people can't see stuff, but what's the mechanism by which I'm confident that only I can see the data on my chain. And then of course, the people that need to be able to see it, like for instance, the the notion that, you know, you may need to claw a share back or, or burn a token. So presumably there's somebody that can see more, um, yeah. which is what regulators want. So how, what's the push pull there? Yeah, so legally you need uh, some centralized entity, unfortunately, to manage the share cap table, right? So it can be seen in a certain uh, centralized location and uh, shareholders can uh, come and, and, and see it and so on. And the authorities, of course, need to be able to see it. And that central location is is our system or a competing system, right? So we, ne- we actually keep the share cap table off chain for that purpose. Um, but any sort of transaction, any sort of change in the share cap table, of course, happens on on chain, and then it's reflected in the in the share cap table off chain. That's that's the way we do it now, and I haven't actually seen any real reason to have the share cap table on chain. Uh, of course, you you could 
possibly decentralized a little bit more, but not not according to regulation. You you can't, right? You need to need to have it somewhere where it's visible for the for the uh, authorities and the the shareholders. I, I think you're already bleeding edge enough, class. We can yeah. we can give you a, we can give you a small totally. break on I the cap table. <laughs> I don't think people have thought through how difficult this is. And, and I know that that's the yeah. business model you have is uh, we thought through all the difficult stuff. It sounds like you really have. So. Yeah. Um, fabulous uh, interview so far, Klaus. I, I, I'm really excited about this. I know Mike and I each have a, a couple closing questions before we let you run away. So I'll, I'll let Mike go first. Yeah, Klaus, can you just talk about your, your company, the team, and how you get everything done? It sounds like you, you must have thousands of employees. Yeah, yeah, I, I wish. So we are 30, 30 now. Uh, I'm based in Denmark, right? So the majority of the team is is here local with me. But actually, as mentioned earlier, we we have redomiciled to the US. So the future major expansion will be on the US side in Miami, where we have the headquarters of the US side. So we'll keep technology, I think, in Europe close to me, and then we'll build sales and marketing up in the US in the future. Um, What we are already today, most of our people are sitting remote. As is common practice in the blockchain space. So we have people in, I don't know, seven or eight countries. Some of them need to be there for sales purposes to be local to clients, but others are software developers that are just, yeah, prefer to work from home, frankly. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, the time zones, I can, you know, are, are terrible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and my last question real quick is you mentioned an exchange and I'm not going to yep. let you leave here without, without giving a few more details, if you don't mind. Uh, cause to me, that's, again, this is the most fascinating thing that anyone in blockchain could possibly be talking about. Yeah. So we are working on an exchange, uh, both on the European side and the U S side. So of course this is relatively complicated because we need to, we actually need to get licenses for this, um, and licenses that are not easy to get and will take take us some time, right? But we have the licensing framework in place now for Germany, working on the European side, and then we are we actually speaking to the SEC right now about licensing for the US, and hopefully we'll be able to get that in place over the next few months. Um, we are not launching a normal exchange like an ATS in the in the US. We are launching. Uh, we're trying to to base our exchange on DeFi technology, right? So it's based on automated market maker technology from Balancer. We see Balancer as the top technical provider in the space. They they are working on new technology for liquidity pools that will allow us to have circuit breakers as it is called so basically the ability to have more control over the trading for instance to to control the trading within a a narrow band close to the appraised value of the property itself so we have much more control over what's being traded and the price and so on compared to what you had in the old days and we also have the ability to sort of to combine the security token protocols with the actual automated market maker uh, smart contract itself right Mm. so so we like we like the DeFi idea, even though we'll still be working in sort of a semi-permission environment, but but a very large one at that, uh, because we think that the DeFi native technologies will be more interoperable with other sort of actors in the DeFi ecosystem uh, longer term. So it'll be more easy for us to sort of connect to DeFi lending partners and so on, and uh, other types of uh, innovative actors that we are sure will turn up in the ecosystem longer term. I love that. I love that. That's fabulous. So as we bring it to a close here, and again, I appreciate your time with us today and, and really for all Y Whales and, and other members out there kind of watching and listening to this, what, what thoughts would you have on, on how to be successful um, as, a, as a Web3 entrepreneur? You know, how, how do you kind of see this space evolving, um, you know, over, over the next, uh, you know, couple quarters? <laughs> a couple of years is hard to deal with. Um, but, you know, where do you see this going in, in 23 and, and, you know, how for other people that are interested in, in the digitization of, of assets, um, um, how, how best can they get involved? I chose actually to get involved in this space for five, six years ago as a kind of career decision. I think it's the space is a little bit like you, the old uh, cable TV industry in the US where a lot of actors got involved and all of them made a lot of money, right? Because it was a growing space for many years like also starting in the internet space in the early days, right? And just sticking to it and learning about it and finding your own specialty. So I think you, as, as a web, as, 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 yeah, as an entrepreneur, a startup guy, you should, I think you should just expose yourself to it, start working on a project, learn, keep learning, make a lot of pivots possibly, right? And eventually hopefully find the business model that works. 
um, I think all of it, it's still early days as we discussed, right? So how bad can it can it can it go? Uh, uh, we, we, of course, we see companies going going down all the time in the crypto space because it's so volatile. But I think that people can bounce back and uh, learn from their mistakes and hopefully become successful in the second or the third round. That's fabulous. No, I, I very much appreciate the, those insights and thoughts. And, and at the end of the day, I, I'll summarize it. it. It's hard. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of insight. And you're going to have you're going to have to you know be able to accept failures, no matter how good you are and how yeah. good you, you your team is, um, because the asset class is so volatile. There is so many yeah. things that are occurring. And I really, really um, can't thank you enough for your time today with the, the amount of projects you have on your plate. I, I know your schedule is very busy. Klaus, uh, how can people uh, best find DigiShares and, and you uh, if they want to reach out and have any other questions? Yeah, so they can reach us uh, through our uh, webpage, through LinkedIn, uh, through Telegram, where we also have a channel. So it's yeah, it's very easy. Uh, Twitter, it's very easy to find us. Fabulous. Myself. Fabulous. Um, for from Y Wales, uh, this has been DigiShares uh, with Klaus and uh, Mafia Mike with us today as well. Uh, thank you guys so much for your time, Y Wales. We'll catch you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>